Hello, I'm here with Mike Bracken, a partner of Public Digital and one of the lead thinkers in digital transformation in governments. He's also the mind behind the uh, digital government service in the UK. And we're here to talk about uh, dig digital transformation in governments and the use of data in the health sector. Hello, Mike. Hi. One of the big questions that we have is, uh, we're in the middle of this transformation in which uh, a lot of data is being gathered and we're talking about interoperability and building big databases that have a lot of information. So uh, how do we move from having data to being able to analyze it so that the gathering of data doesn't become an end in itself and we actually get value from the data? That's a good question. I, I, I think the, the issue is, is that before we have to gather and analyze and, and deploy a whole bunch of data practices, we should start asking ourselves in government, what problem are we trying to solve? What is the need of the user here? Because by definition, government is in a position to collect a great amount of data for a huge amount of issues, whether it be motoring or uh, tax or pensions or health or indeed anything that a government does. The first question should be, why would the government collect that data? Why would it collect and store it? For what purpose? Most governments don't really have coherent data management policies because the data practices have grown up over time uh, in different parts of government for different policy needs. So I suspect that, that most governments are actually inefficient in the current collection and curation methods but shouldn't worry too much about that. They should probably stop collecting some data and be much more focused on answering, asking some questions. The way to determine, I think the best way to determine what those questions should be is to look closely at what users are actually using government for right now. What needs are being met and what needs are currently not being met. If you look at which transactions are used and why, by whom, how many of them fail to finish a transaction, what are the real things that people are looking for online, you can find out a lot about what service, services and what uh, information governments are failing to fill. And at that point, we can use the data that we have to start filling some of those gaps. Thank you. Are there any, any models that uh, countries can look at and uh, follow so that they get to a situation in which they ask the right questions and then look for, are able to use the data to answer those questions? Well, um, the f in terms of a model, I mean, I think there's two types of model. Firstly, most countries need a, 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 some form of digital service function at the centre. And the model for that that I would recommend all countries is that to be aligned to the centre of government, whether it be a president or a prime minister's office, somewhere near the centre, levers of power, and also near the finance ministry or the economic ministry. And having a multidisciplinary digital team capable of reacting to the the, the, the changing user needs or indeed the changing policy needs of a, a government, that's a no regrets move. In terms of a model for setting up data analytics and man management, we identify in a report with uh, the IDB three types of model. Uh, we can use a centralized model, a federated model or an ecosystem model. The centralized model is as it would suggest where you put most of your data capability in the center in one place. Federated is where you have different departments, different ministries with different data capabilities, but working together to set open standards. And the third model of the ecosystem is where you have external forces, maybe open data or third sector organizations or private sector organizations participating in a data economy. All the models have validity. It depends on the context in which the government finds itself. Are there any char particular characteristics that would make one model more appealing to a particular country? Well, I think a centralized model works particularly well where you have strong levers of power in the centre. Uh, uh, an ecosystem or a federated model works particularly well where you have strong state and federal uh, arms of government. And uh, we're, uh, once we have, if we have, we're able to build the, cap the uh, capability to uh, ask the right questions and then we have some capacity to analyze the data. Of course, uh, one of the um, topics that are currently um, being asked by, by people is, uh, okay, so a gov the government has all, all this data, are there any, any ethical concerns that uh, uh, may be part of the uh, institutional solution and may, be, may have to be taken into consideration uh, for using data that in many cases is confidential and especially in the health sector, 
uh, that handles a lot of uh, very uh, confidential information for, from people. The whole area is fraught with difficulty. I think that governments really need to think about refreshing their general principles towards data, not from a regulatory point of view, but from a, a usage point of view. Most government data that people think of as government data is actually an aggregation of personal data. So who transacted where, with what and when, particularly in health. Um, even health is fraught with issues. You would think that the medical records of an individual belong to that individual. But in my country, the UK, if you present yourself at a hospital or a doctor's and you have a life-threatening viral disease which is easily transmitted, you'll find that your health records suddenly become a matter of public uh, scrutiny for goodwill because it's there to protect more people than just yourself. So I think that to try to finely tune regulatory approaches to uses of data is not, or, or not always that useful at the moment. I think what is generally more useful is where governments adopt general principles towards data management. Things like the principle that the, uh, the default position for data is that it is owned by the user. The principle that the user has, should have the choice uh, to see what data the government holds up about him or her and a principle that uh, after a period of time uh, a user has the ability to uh, retire or hide a set of data uh, if it feels it's no longer useful. These are principles that governments may want to consider over the next few years to increase trust that people uh, in their citizens that their data has been used appropriately. A much more important thing to improve trust that governments can do quickly is design services that have data built into them so that you don't report using data on a service but that you can see at the point of use so digitally what data the government has about that, about that service and what data it has about you. And that's really an issue for service design and governments need to design those services to build trust in users. And for the users to have the access to change the correct information. Absolutely. And that requires things like a first and second factor of identity so they can recognize who they are digitally and change and update some information. Once you get to a position where users trust their government to do that regularly, I think you find that you get a much more heightened level of trust and therefore engagement in the democratic process. In the UK, when we transformed our register to vote service, we don't have electronic voting, but the register on which you have to be on to vote is an electronic asset. The process to get on that, when we change that to make it easier for people who are in hard to reach places such as multiple user dwellings or people who are young and don't have much of a voting record who are move house uh, regularly, we found that we added three million more people onto the electoral register and that changed the outcome of our general election in 2016. At a time of increasing user cynicism towards government, it's got to be a good outcome that we have a improved democratic process, improved democratic participation as a result of users trusting government services. And what would you say to a minister who wants to innovate and uh, uh, has uh, uh, perhaps even, even uh, political support to innovate in the health sector, but thinks or feels that they cannot, don't have enough resources, financial resources, or don't have the pool of people with the necessary skills to build a, a, an adequate team to analyze mm -hmm. data and bring to the ministry? Well, firstly, I would suggest that the first thing to do is to spend a small amount of money building an excellent team. Because uh, in health, for instance, health technology purchasing at scale is not cheap and is often from highly expensive proprietary lock-in vendors. Whereas for possibly a couple of million dollars over a, a life of a parliament, you could build an absolutely world-class digital team who can help create services and uh, use the data that uh, is open to them uh, to great effect. So funding people rather than funding products is, is a good idea. I'd also suggest to any minister who wants to innovate in health is that innovation is very expensive and doesn't usually change the underlying bureaucratic processes or tensions that are within a service. Transformation, where you're changing the heart of the operation, is much more useful to most people and will have much more longer term political um, impact and benefit for more, for more people. Innovation generally leads to flashy things that catch the attention for a period of time if you manage to catch people's attention just before an election, then that's well-timed.
but generally they don't have a long-term uh, effect uh, that's hopeful. You need root and branch transformation for that. When you talk about uh, uh, processes, existing processes, it brings me to uh, something that you hear a lot about, uh, legacy systems and mm -hmm. legacy uh, processes. And uh, in some cases, legacy, not necessarily legacy software, but also legacy paper systems. Uh, and what do you do with all those uh, processes and, and uh, uh, methods to capture information that in some cases will be in paper, in some cases will yes. be legacy systems that are probably antiquated? Do you find a way to adopt those and incorporate them into a new uh, process or do you start over? Start over generally. I mean, it's hard to talk about every example, but in generically I would say start over. The reason that those things are legacy, whether they be legacy systems or processes or operations, is that they're usually designed to meet a policy intent from 10, 20, 30 years ago. And it's almost certain that using the tools of the open internet and modern service delivery methods a better service can, can be created, a better process can be created for a fraction of the cost. But if all your time and attention and energy and money is focused on keeping the legacy going, then it's very hard to uh, give people the time and space they need to come up with a, uh, a new thing from, from scratch. It's also hugely more uh, financially viable to close this stuff down and start again. Thank you. And uh, if you had uh, the opportunity to talk with uh, a health minister who has these legacy systems and is also uh, uh, pro uh, uh, in innovation and use of information and doing things better. Uh, what would be the three recommendations that you would give to that minister? I would recommend to the minister that they keep the ambition level really simple and that they ground it in the needs of users. So too often innovation t tends to be around the next technology, fad or fashion. So it could be a blockchain, big data, whatever service. But mostly the user's problems in health are much more mundane. Their problems are the fact that the, they don't have electronic registers to register themselves with doctors or hospitals, that they can't validate their home or their address on those systems, that they have to carry around inoculation cards because there's, no uh, there's no digital register of those sorts of things. And creating those services, which are effectively all supplementary to the health experience, has a much more profound exper uh, impact than it does in doing a sort of big IT project. In what way, is there a particular way to reach, methods to reach and listen to the users and get close to, the, to those uh, fundamental problems that to, you yeah. need to start with? Watch them. I mean, literally go and watch users uh, at, at the point of use of, of health services, so whether it be hospitals or doctors or pharmacies, and generally see what people are trying to do, the barriers put in their way, the problems that they have, communication and language and so on, and then fix those problems really quickly. One of the, I, I can guarantee that many of your countries, one of the problems they will have is that the health providers, the language that they use is confusing to the people who are consuming health services. And that often leads to the rise of intermediaries. People have to translate between one and the other. Often they're not doing it with great, uh, uh, efficiency nor great values so speak making sure the communication between provider and user is is open and clear but it's, it sounds very simple because it is but it's, these are some of the health problems that people have and is this the the the, the watching the, is this how you did it in the UK did, yeah. did you start watching users we I mean I insisted that everyone who worked in in my part of government that grew to several thousand spent uh, multiple hours a month watching users basically doing user research, watching users use services, seeing how what works, what doesn't, doing interviews, um, watching them in offices, visiting offices, looking at services, how they work, and it's fascinating. Well, um, Mike, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it, um, this will be very useful for our, our platform and to help uh, our governments do a better job in digital transformation. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Good luck.